Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Secret Scope, brought to you by your favorite MD duos, Dr. Samantha Galman and Dr. Adeline Vadrar, where we are here to bring you your weekly dose of beauty, health, and wellness secrets. We're finally launched. We're so excited to kick this podcast off. We're going to be bringing you lots of content, lots of exciting information. We hope you like it. Before we begin, we just want to Thank everyone so much for liking our page, commenting, following us. And if you haven't done so, please do. We're at The Secret Scope on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Follow us. Tell us what you want to hear. If you have questions, let us know. Also, our website has finally launched. It's www.thesecretscope.com. On there, you could find the show notes from all the episodes that you hear. We're going to be giving links to all the items that we're talking about and much more. So yeah, it should be really fun. Go check that out. Also stick around for the end where I'll be giving details about our little giveaway and tips. So on this week's episode, we are talking all about SPF, fun in the sun. We're going to dive behind the science of the sun, what it does to our skin. We're going to be talking about skin cancer, SPF, if you really know what it means. We're also going to talk about the toxic and non-toxic ingredients and much, much more. And with that being said, let's begin. SPF stands for sun protecting factor. So what are you really protecting, you might ask? Well, that's the UV rays. There's UVA and UVB. So let's start with UVA. Think of the A for aging. And what happens is uh, the long wavelengths attack your skin into the dermis, which is your second layer of the skin. And in the dermis, you have proteins like elastin and collagen. And those are the proteins that basically make you look youthful, which you want to protect because you know you don't want those wrinkles. And what happens is the elastin produces enzymes called metalloproteinases, and those further degrade collagen. So that's what causes wrinkling and causes you to age. Now, for UVB, think of the B for burning, and that is what is responsible for causing your last sunburn when you went to the beach. Now, don't forget, just because you maybe didn't get burnt, that doesn't mean that UVA is not still there damaging your skin. So just because you have no signs of it, you still have to protect yourself from UVB and UVA. So I'm saying this like the sun is bad, but in reality, don't think of it like that. The sun is also very good for you because it's a source of vitamin D. And sometimes vitamin D is lacked in our diet. So the easiest way to get it is from just exposing yourself to the sun. And Samantha is going to talk about more of how much time you need to expose yourself in a healthy manner. And there's also something that we want to touch up upon is seasonal depression. There are cases where some people, when the seasons change from, let's say, summer to fall, winter, their mood goes down, and it's maybe because they're not getting enough sunlight. So like I said, the sun is not as bad as you think it is, so don't always try to hide from it. Thank you, Adeline. Um, it's actually back to the point of the seasonal affective disorder. It, actually, it stands for sad because you get sad when you don't get enough light in general. So the fun fact about that is that what people do for treatment, especially in the winter months when you probably don't get a lot of sun from the outside, what they do is they basically put a light inside the house or whatever, by your bed, by your desk. And this light is supposed to actually give you more happiness and kind of treats sad. Yeah. So that's kind of amazing. There's this uh, rock lamp that actually I've seen on Instagram, on social media. People buy it off Amazon. If you guys want a link, we could always link that. And it's supposed to, great idea. you know, brighten up your mood. I think that's a great idea. We'll link that in the show notes for you guys. Okay, so guys, 40% of the U.S. population suffers from vitamin D deficiency. I could probably assume that that number is higher given all of us are now hiding from the sun because we're all at fear of getting skin cancer or getting wrinkly and old. Uh, Vitamin D is actually made from cholesterol, 
And it's when the cholesterol and the sunlight interact together against your skin, and then your vitamin D is activated. Other than that, it exists in your body and in an active form. So active vitamin D is responsible for absorption of calcium and phosphorus. Both of those things are very important for bone growth. So when you have vitamin D deficiency, what ends up happening is that you're increased risk for osteoporosis, depression, and muscle weakness. You could get vitamin D from certain foods. So a lot of people will be like, oh, why do I need to sit out in the sun when I could just eat certain things? But the meals you're going to eat are like cod liver oil, swordfish, salmon, canned tuna, egg yolks, sardines, and beef liver. Aside from salmon, I doubt anyone is going to be eating these foods every day to get their source of vitamin D. Uh, Also, a lot of people think, oh, if I sit by a window, let's say if you work at a window that has natural sunlight coming through, will I get enough vitamin D source? And the truth is it doesn't penetrate through the window. It has to be direct sunlight onto your skin. And therefore that will still leave you as vitamin D deficient. So the verdict is the best source of vitamin D is to get it throughout the day out of the sunlight. Um, They say midday 12 PM is when UVB is more intense, but that's also because it's so intense at that time. That's also the best time to get your vitamin D source. So you have to pick and choose your battles of when you want to be out in order to get enough vitamin D, but also be protecting your skin from the effects of the sun. So the timelines for when you should hide really continue to change. Before they used to say you can't be out in the sun between 12 and 4. Now they're saying don't be out in the sun between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So basically, in order to get your daily recommended dose of vitamin D, which is 600 international units, you should go out into the sun, I would say, between 3 and 4 p.m. This way you're avoiding this intense UVB exposure. You do this for about 10 to 30 minutes, three times a week. And this way you can protect yourself from skin cancer but you also get enough vitamin D to make sure you're not deficient. Um, They say that around 30 minutes of sun, this is like a fun fact if anyone's interested, it's estimated to produce about 10 to 20,000 international units of vitamin D, which is way more than the 600 that your daily dose is recommended. Uh, And then also another fun fact about this is that the strength of the sun is affected on where you are in the map. So let's say if you're on the, by the equator, like in Africa or South America, closer to the equator, that's when the sun is stronger. So you have to think about the, your requirements of the sun. So if you're farther away, you might need 45 minutes to be out in the sun in order to get that vitamin D. Okay, so now Adeline's probably going to talk about a little bit about melanin so we can know what that is, about what is SPF and other important things we need to know when it comes to skin. Yes. So melanin is basically a chemical pigment and what it does, it it protects our skin against damage from excess sunlight. And also a thing that a lot of people might not know is that dark skin people are more protected because they have more melanin. Melanin is basically a dark pigment. That's what causes you to be tan. And they're protected from skin cancer more likely than those with fair skin. But the thing is, they are more likely to be deficient in vitamin D, which is actually pretty interesting. I didn't know that before. Yeah. And the protective factor of um, melanin needs to be considered. Yeah, it protects you from like skin cancer, but you could still obtain it, even if you're darker skin. Okay. Now, the moment that a lot of you, I hope, have been waiting for, what is SPF? Now, let's be honest. You have definitely seen SPF 15, 30, 45, even 100, but do you really even know what those numbers mean? No. Nope. Because I honestly, I did not know what they meant before. Did you, Samantha? No, oh, right? Not really. I just knew that, oh, the higher the SPF, the less likely I'm going to tan. So SPF 50 was a no-go because God forbid I went out in the sun and didn't get any color when I was younger. I actually got burnt using SPF 100. And back then when I didn't know anything about SPF, I was like, how is this possible? But I'm going to explain to you how SPF works right now. So this is on average, but it says uh, based on research that everyone's skin can take up to, let's say, 15 minutes to burn from the sun without being protected, no SPF on. So for example, let's say it takes you 10 minutes to get burnt. And you go to the store and you get an SPF 30. So what you want to do is take 10 minutes, 10 times 30, which is 300. 
And what you're going to do is divide that number by 60 minutes, 60 minutes one, in one hour, and you'll get five, which is five hours. So by wearing SPF 30, you are preventing yourself from burning 30 times longer uh, than you would if you weren't wearing any SPF. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So next time, if you are wondering when is the next time to apply, and don't forget, if you are going to the beach and you're putting on SPF, you're thinking, I'm protecting myself, I'm being good, and you go into the water and you swim, and you come out and you don't reapply, that is no, 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 no good. <laughs> Definitely not good for you. Basically, uh, the Skin Cancer Foundation recommends that a water-resistant or broad-spectrum sunscreen with SPF of 30 or higher for any extended outdoor activity, regardless of the SPF though, it's important to apply one ounce, which is two tablespoons, 30 minutes before you go outside and reapply it every two hours or immediately after swimming or sweating because the water will basically wash away the SPF. And also now let's take it to the next step. So since you need UVA protection also, you want to make sure that the SPF is broad spectrum because that means it covers both UVA and UVB. And we're going to discuss different broad spectrum uh, SPFs that we both recommend later. And there's also another way that the SPF number tells you how long the sun's UV radiation would take to make your skin red. And when using the product exactly as directed versus the amount of time without any sunscreen. So with, let's say, SPF 30, it would take you 30 times longer to burn, like I said, if you weren't wearing sunscreen. And in terms of the rays, an SPF 30 allows about 3% of UVB rays to hit your skin. And let's say SPF of 50 allows about 2%. So the higher you go, basically, the less the UV rays can penetrate into your skin. And it might seem like that's a small difference, like three to two, but you need to realize that SPF 30 is allowing 50% more UV radiation onto your skin. So remember that if you're going to wear a higher SPF, it doesn't mean, though, that you can stay out in the sun longer or swim with it without reapplying. You should definitely do uh, you should definitely reapply so it doesn't decrease the effectiveness of not wearing SPF. Yeah, that's very true. I think that's a great point to start. There's a lot of things we're debunking now that we know this info because there's we're always talking about, oh, skin, so important, this, that, but we don't know exactly what we're doing to protect ourselves. So just putting the SPF on doesn't really do anything. You have to reapply. You have to make sure you're applying it the right way and protecting your skin in other ways as well. Super important. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the chemicals we use in SPF. So this is the real science behind SPF. These are the things that most people don't know. There's a lot of, um, I wouldn't say myths, but a lot of things that go on regarding the certain chemicals that we use that we have this fear that we can't use them, but it's not necessarily the case because we still don't have enough information to know how harmful these products actually are. So the sunscreens were put on the market before FDA approval. So only in 2018 that FDA came up with this suggestion for sunscreen that any active ingredient that has a blood level greater than 0.5 nanograms needs to have a formal toxicology study done. So there are different types of SPF chemicals, and we're going to talk about like physical, chemical, and um, which ones are better for you, which ones are worse, and all the myths regarding it. So the physical sunscreens, these are the mineral sunscreens. So how they work, they act basically as a shield, so they deflect the rays of the sun from your skin. So they contain active ingredients known as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. Sometimes it's in a combination of both. So these are usually preferred for people who have sensitive skin. They're also known by the FDA as the grace chemicals, generally recognized as safe and effective. These are the ones that leave that ugly white residue, um, and that's why a lot of people hate them, but they really are the best at protecting you from the sun. You know, speaking of the white residue, I remember my mom would slather SPF on me when I was little, and I just hated it because I was the only kid running around looking like that, but if it was today, I would be kissing my mom because basically, if you didn't know, your chance of getting skin cancer in the future uh, depends a lot on whether you got burnt as a child excessively or not. 
Yeah, that's a very fair point. So th- these are things we'll like also expand upon as we go along through the show. Um, the other chemicals we talk about, so these are chemical sunscreens. So uh, PABA, tolamine salicylate. So these are not in the grace chemical list and they're also not legally sold in the US. So if you're obtaining these, you're probably obtaining them through some shady website online and they're not FDA approved. Others for which we need more safety data, there's 12 in total, and they're the chemical sunscreens that act as a sponge. So unlike the mineral sunscreens, these absorb the rays. So they contain one or more of these. It's going to be the insilazole, octisalate, homosalate, octocrylene, octanoxate, oxybenzone, avobenzone, and these need a lot more uh, information regarding them and their safety. So now we could, in that sense, we could talk a little bit about like the harms of SPF. So the FDA did a prelim study. It used 24 volunteers. What they did was they basically put sunscreen on four times a day for one week without any interaction with the sunlight. And then they tested their blood levels for avobenzone, oxybenzone, octocrylene, and a capsule. These are the most common like active ingredients that are found in SPF. And what they found was all four chemicals were present uh, more than that 0.5 nanogram cutoff in the blood. So what they basically concluded from this preliminary study was that drug accumulation means that more you, the more you put in, the more concentrated it became in the blood, and it would increase accordingly. And then also they saw that there was a slow washout. So the half-life seemed to be like a few days for these SPFs. So they stayed in the system for a prolonged time. But even with that said, these correlations aren't really definitive. There is no causality relationship between them. So you need to do long-term studies to really see the exact risk or if it's indeed bad for you. And also, let's not forget at the end of the day, these things are still barriers that protect you from skin cancer. So At the end of the day, you should be using these products unless you know for sure that they're causing like an allergic reaction on your skin or you're very sensitive, in which case you'll probably be using mineral sunscreens. I mean, you could use the mineral sunscreen, to be honest, over all of them. I would personally do that. But if you really hate the look of the white pasty look that a lot of the mineral sunscreens cause, you probably should then use a chemical sunscreen. Yeah, I know a lot of people have like a fear or just really hate that white chalky thing i see a lot of people commenting on other influencer pages saying i don't care i don't want that white chalky face it's really like a personal preference at the end of the day of what you want but if you want the best protection from the sun it will probably be a mineral sunscreen i mean there are new ones we'll discuss them a little later that kind of cause less of um, the whiteness, but it's also the way you rub it in and has to be applied the right way. So those things have to be also taken into consideration. Let's talk about um, the most commonly talked about ingredient. I'm sure you guys have heard, there's a lot of people like influencers, a lot of people talking about oxybenzone. So there's this website, it's called EWG. It's basically this organization that uncovers all these bad ingredients in SPF. So um, they're saying that oxybenzone can act as a weak estrogen, which is a hormone disruptor then, and also as a moderate antiandrogen, which has associations with altered birth weight. And this was seen in human studies. However, we don't have enough data to know the harmful effects of oxybenzone. And this is why this is one of the ingredients that's actually being tested by the FDA so that if there will be a problem, we'll know about it. It'll be FDA approved or disapproved, and it won't be put into other SPFs in the future. Uh, Why this one is super talked about all the time? Because basically they found that nearly all sunscreens that have oxybenzone have a significant blood concentration of 200. Remember the other ones had a 0.5? This one is 200. So it's very potent in your SPFs. So the other one that also people talk about is octanoxate. It is also an active ingredient that has hormone-like activity. It supposedly affects the reproductive system, was associated with alterations in thyroid and behavioral issues. And this was seen in animal studies, not in human studies. Um, They say both of these cause skin allergies, but in general, a lot of the chemical sunscreens will cause skin allergies. Other chemicals we could discuss, homosalate, this one is thought to disrupt estrogen, androgen, and progesterone. There's also octosalate and octocrylene, but we don't really know their mechanism of action or their effects on the skin or your health. Out of the chemical ones, abobenzone is actually the one that has the best UVA protection, has the limited skin penetration, so it doesn't really concentrate in your blood, and offers no hormone disruption. So if there's a chemical one that you're very like 
set on using. It should be one that contains avobenzone and nothing else. Uh, there's also a newer ingredient uh, currently under testing. It's called Mexeril SX. Um, it's pending FDA approval, so it's not commonly seen in the U.S., but this one is not associated with hormone disruption. And once it is FDA approved, you'll see it pop up more in a lot of the SPF ingredients. So now, Adeline, maybe we should talk a little bit about other things like the pros of SPF? So the pros. There are two safe ingredients that the FDA recognized, and those are titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. So when you are going out and trying to find the correct sunscreen, make sure that the zinc oxide is greater than 20%. That will cover from all the UV rays, which is excellent. And if it's not, then make sure that both of them are included in the ingredients. And so once again, these are the ones that make you look pasty white, but they are the least harmful things that you could put on your skin. So that's the benefit of it. And there's no evidence of hormone disruption. And there is a small likelihood that there is skin penetration, but that's just 0.01%. And it's only seen with zinc oxide, which happens to have excellent UVA protection. Remember, UVA for aging. You don't want those wrinkles. So also note that there are many inactive ingredients that make up the entire bottle of SPF. And one of the most concerning one, and that's off note, is I'm going to pronounce this wrong. It's methyl isothiazolinone. Wow. Say that wow. three times fast. You can't. Um, yeah. However, there like aren't enough studies to be done regarding the risks associated. But the main issue is that there is uh, an association with skin allergies, especially in children. But to settle that entire matter, per FDA, they still say, given the recognized public health benefits of sunscreen use, that Americans should still continue to use sunscreen and other sun protective measures, as it's important to protect yourself against skin cancer and damage. Yeah, that's very true. So now we could finally get into types of skin cancer, which is a very important part, which is why we hide from the sun to begin with, aside from the aging. So let's talk about the three different types. Um, obviously, there's basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. These are the three, basal cell being the most innocent one and then melanoma being the most dangerous form because it could once you get it it's very aggressive it could metastasize everywhere if it's not caught early so that's something we'll talk about so for basal cell it's the most common it almost never metastasizes but it could be disfiguring um, in certain parts of the body uh, it usually looks like a red patch maybe like an open sore with some type of pink growth it occurs due to cumulative and intense sun exposure so basically it's a lot of sun that you got over a period of time um, more than 4 million cases are diagnosed actually in the U.S. each year. So that's like an, a staggering that's amount of crazy. people who get this. I know, it's insane. Also, basal cell is actually the most common type of skin cancer, uh, well, most common type of skin cancer, but it's also the most common cancer. But we never talk about it because it never metastasizes or anything. People just get it removed and keep moving on with their lives. Um, it's the most frequent occurring form of all cancers. And like I just said, and then it's very important to, in order to like treat these things, we need to basically remove it. We'll talk a little bit about my personal experience with basal cell and like how important skin checks are, how you prevent it and what to do once you have it. It'll probably also be really good to do another pod just talking about the skin cancers alone. Cause there's a lot of stuff about it that a lot of people don't know and kind of just like even the other day, I had a friend text me. She sent me a text saying that she got a dysplastic nevus. And she's like, oh, can I get it removed like later? No big deal. It's just a mole. But people don't understand the importance of how these things could convert into something worse and how important it is to act now. Because we look at something so small and we're like, oh, no big deal. I'll think about it later. But some of these things are a big deal. So it's very important to speak to a dermatologist whenever you have something you think does not look right. I completely agree. And For sure. Like Samantha said, if in the future you would guys would want us to talk about it, just let us know. Leave it in the comments on our SPF post, and we'll be glad to do some research and do another episode on it. Let's talk about now the second most common cause of skin cancer, which is squamous cell. So this involves the outermost layer of the skin, which is the epidermis, and that's because the epidermis contains squamous cells. 
and it looks like basal cell, but it's more warty like and it has a central depression, so it's indented in the middle. And in this uh, cancer, more than 1 million people are diagnosed per year. And what happens is it's from long term UV exposure from the sun over your lifetime. And it's believed that indoor tanning, so those of you who go to tanning beds, this is the cancer that attacks you it's we were increased all guilty from that <laughs> yeah this is the cancer that are is seen a lot in young women because they think that tanning beds oh it's not the sun i'm fine the tanning bed looks like a coffin for a reason let's just say that <laughs> <For sure. laughs> and so what happens is with this cancer the most common areas can be on the lower lip on the face on your hands arms legs it's anywhere that has been exposed to the, to the sun for a long time in your life um so melanoma it's the most dangerous form of skin cancer i'm sure everyone knows that so what happens is it's when unrepaired dna damage occurs to the skin cells and it triggers mutations a lot of the people have like a genetic predisposition to this so it's due to genetic defects because it even occurs in people who hide from the sun and when you find them the spots that melanoma occurs on it'll like be in the back of your butt on like the bottom of your foot in places where the sun usually never shines um basically with this one once you get these mutations that go on in your skin cells this leads for the skin cells to multiply rapidly and they form malignant tumors so they originate in melanocytes which is the basal layer of the epidermis majority of the melanomas that you see could are black or brown they could also be other colors as well. They're caused by intense occasional UV exposure. So it's like that one time you went in the sun and got super sunburned. And sometimes they're even by people who didn't go out in the sun at all. It's not like a cumulative, oh, I've been going to the sun for 20 years and then I got this. It could be that one time that you got really burned, blisters, worst burn of your life. And that could have triggered this whole cascade. Um, so basically, that's why it's also more common in people who are genetically predisposed. It's more common in men, more than women. It can metastasize virtually everywhere, which is why this one is so, so important to catch early. It'll go to places no other cancers are known to go. And this is why like doctors are usually fascinated about how melanoma spreads. Like it'll go to the, it could metastasize to the heart. It could metastasize to the brain. It goes to everywhere. Um, also other things about it. So the important things is how we do kind of like a staging type thing when you first think about melanoma. If you go to your dermatologist, there's this acronym he follows. It's called ABCDE. We all learn this in med school. We know this as residents and then dermatologists use this still to this day. So the A stands for asymmetry. B stands for border. So it has like a scalloped or notched look to the mole. Um, C for color. So it could be a variety of colors. So you'll have a black spot with like a brown spot around it or like a redness around it. It really, um, it's variable as to what colors it looks like. And then D is for diameter. So smaller diameter means it's likely it's more benign. When you have a, a melanoma, you're thinking something a larger diameter. So basically it will be like the size of their eraser in your pencil tip one fourth of an inch or six millimeters and then e is for evolving so evolving is basically if it's changing in any way like size shape color elevation if it's bleeding new onset itching or crusting that you see at that site melanoma is super dangerous we're definitely going to dedicate a pod just talking about this so you could do self-skin checks before you go to the dermatologist so once there's something that you think is very concerning you could go there and get it checked out and hopefully we'll be able to catch it early and prevent it from ever getting bad. Um, yeah. If yeah. one of you have noticed that you have a mole somewhere on your body or if your, let's say, boyfriend or girlfriend has noticed something that you can't see on your own body, make sure to go to your dermatologist and get it checked out, even if you think that it's nothing because it could be something. I'm not saying it. I don't hope it is. But it's better to be safe than sorry. Agreed. That's like the motto for everything. Um, yes, and then, um, yeah, I think this is like a good time for me to talk a little bit about my personal experience with skin cancer. Um, I actually had basal cell 
I got it, I think I was 21 years old. Um, so I love being in the sun as a kid. I'm sure Adeline can relate. Our Eastern European parents love to throw their kids into the sun without any sun protection. Thanks, mom. But we didn't know back then. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> Um, so basically as a kid, I used to get like sunburns, like everyone else. I'm light skinned. I have blue eyes. So I definitely am prone to, I, I tan, but I'm prone to burning before tan. And when you were younger, you'd be like, okay, let me burn. And then this burn's going to develop. That is me. Tan. <laughs> that would be me. I, I was so stupid when I was younger. So I stupid. literally would love to burn so that I could turn tan. It's craziness. And even like as a teenager, we would all, I remember we'd go to the beach. Like we would do, what did we use? What did you use on your skin instead of SPF? Someone once told me to use beer. Yes. <laughs> so I remember. I think we did that. I think we I did do it. it. And guess what? I got really burnt. <laughs> and then it turned into tan. So it's, it was kind of like a thing that back then that we would always do. So and then I went away. I went to Antigua, actually. We were like on the beach, whatever. And I saw like this weird scab on my shoulders. And obviously shoulders are a common sight to like get burned on because they're always out, even in the summer, if you're in a bathing suit or if you're fully clothed, your shoulders are usually out anyway, like if you're wearing a tank top. And I was like, oh, I have this like red scab. What is this? And as a joke, he's like, oh, you have cancer. And then um, I was like, no, seriously, we should probably check this out. So I went home. And I went to a dermatologist, Dr. Biro, the best dermatologist ever. He's located in Beeridge and in the city. This is not um, an advertisement for him because he probably has no idea. I shouted him out on the podcast. But anyways, so I went to him and he was like, oh, the worst thing it could be is a basal cell. And obviously in my head, I'm like, cancer? What do you mean? I'm 21. No way. So he took a little biopsy, called us back in, told us it was cancer, basal cell. And we started crying, me and my mom at the office. I remember like I was thinking the worst because this is right before medical school. I knew nothing about this. And you're automatically like assuming, oh, that's it. Like it's over. Uh, he did tell me I'm very, very young to be having this. But this doesn't increase the risk for melanoma. It's a separate thing. So you just have to monitor your skin. And after that, it kind of changed the way I think about taking care of my skin. Initially, I would still go in the sun, wear a patch over it. Okay, great. But um, in general, I started to think about, wow, I really need to protect myself from the sun. Like if this happened already, that's how you know that it's the burning that occurred when I was like 10 years old. All of that affected me developing this earlier. Had I not been in tanning beds as a kid, had my mom not owned a tanning salon, had I not went to a tanning salon in hopes to be dark so I don't burn when I'm on vacation then maybe these things wouldn't have happened. And in a way, it's kind of a good thing that we know about this because now we could protect ourselves from it worsening in the future. Um, so what ended up happening was he did a Mohs micrographic surgery and there's different ways you could remove it. You could just take it out. You could do a wide excision. So you basically go beyond the borders of the cancer site and remove it all. Or you could do like a Mohs procedure, which is usually actually done on like pe when people have the cancer on their face it's like an area where it's not going to look as good if you remove it. So what they do is they take a little scraping and then they look under it under the microscope, take a little more scraping. So basically they keep scraping until they don't see any more cancer there. So it's a more delicate way to remove it so that you preserve like whatever your original site looked like. Um, so that's basically what we did. I had stitches because it's on the shoulder. It's kind of like not the greatest area for healing. So you could get like hyper hypertrophied and keloid scars. But um, I did laser after that. And basically, it's just a little scar and a little fun fact that I talk about. Uh, it's freaked me out. And I definitely protect myself from the sun now. But it took me some time to figure that out. Even after I was told I had basal cell, I was like, oh, I'll still go in the sun. So now, now that I'm older, I definitely know the effects of that. So yeah, that's my little story. I hope it's a little insight for everyone. Thank you, Samantha, for sharing that. I think it's important to let our listeners, and even if you have ever suffered from any type of skin cancer and have gotten rid of it, it's important to educate everyone else around you and let them know that the sun is not a joke when it comes to it causing cancer. It's so important. Now let's talk about some secret tips that Samantha and I do in order to protect ourselves. This is just a well-known thing. If you're going out, protect your face with a hat, 
wear protective clothing. Also make sure that the sunglasses you're wearing, there's usually a sticker on it that says UVA and UVB protection. And just so you know, the area that's around your eye is the most delicate area on your skin and it's the most thinnest. So you want to protect that so you don't get wrinkles as you age in that area. And like we said earlier, if you're wearing SPF, make sure you reapply every two hours. If you get wet, if you sweat, go into the pool, even if it says waterproof, don't just pretend that that word is not there. And so my little secret that I want to share with you is when I'm driving in my car, I have a small tube of SPF. And what I do is I apply it to my hands. Basically, if I'm wearing like a tank top, I'll apply it to my whole arm. If I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, I'll only put it on my finger area. Think about it. You're driving all day. The sun is beaming on you. So I'm protecting my hands. Ladies, this is also a tip for you. So if some of you go and do a gel manicure, you're basically putting your hands under UV light. And that's also not good. It's like a tanning bed on your uh, nails. So Samantha, you want to tell them? Yeah. So with that said, basically, there are some melanomas. I want to touch about both things, actually. So in terms of the nails, there are some melanomas that occur in the nail bed. They're more rare and they're usually actually seen in people who are darker skin. So it might not even be sun related, but you could get um, melanomas under your fingernails. The other thing is sometimes people, because like Adeline was saying, how your uh, skin is very thin in the eye region, you could get melanoma in your eye. So Mm -hmm. you have to be very, very careful. Sunglasses are super important. With these gel manicures, we don't really know how these UV rays are going to be affecting your skin in the future because this is something new and I'm sure there aren't any really studies on it. So in the meantime, wear the glove like she's talking about. Yeah, there's these gloves on Amazon that you could uh, put on before you paint your nails and it just exposes your nail beds so that... right the other part of your hand is being protective. What I do is also I put on SPF on my hands before I get a gel manicure. That's amazing. That's very smart. A lot of people don't think about that. And then it's, this is the same thing with SPF. We always thought, oh, it's great, great, great. And now there are things coming out. Oh, maybe it's not that great, which I'm not saying that it's not, but mm-hmm. that would be the same thing. Oh, gel manicures are so good for you. They, your manicure lasts for three, four weeks. But then are there effects to doing this? And But uh, then in 30, 40 years, exactly. what's going to happen? That's everything. So everything in moderation is like the moral of the story in every single episode. We just want you to know that now. Mm-hmm. So yeah. tell us your secret, Samantha. Oh, yeah. So my secret is wearing a lip balm with SPF. It's so, so important, especially in the summer months when you're always out in the sun. Like, for example, people who are more prone um, to getting like people who have herpes, they're more likely to have eruptions when they're out in the sun. It's very weird. I don't know why it happens. It's not just stress. And then when they're out in the sun all day, for some reason, they'll end up developing a cold sore or something like that. So wearing a lip balm and protecting yourself from the sun with SPF inside your lip balm is super important. It also tans. Every part of your body is tanning when it's out in the sun. So you want to protect it. And then the other thing about the lip balm is in terms of... No, what was the other thing? And then also, no, with with your lips... The cancers that we yes. spoke about earlier, we learned in uh, medical school the mnemonic BS. So B for your upper lip, basal cell, and S for your bottom lip, squamous cell. Those are the locations where those cancers are more likely to attack your lips. Which so again the- shows that the sun affects your lips. Yeah, Very no important. BS. <laughs> exactly. If you're also the type that forgets to put on SPF, Put it in front of you. Put it in front of your face wash, your toothbrush, just so you get into the habit of putting it on. Because I know that when I first started to put on SPF, there were some days that I did and I didn't. Oh, and one more thing. If it is raining, if it is snowing, still put it on. UVA, UVB rays are still attacking you. It does not matter. Still wear it. Even if you're going outside for five minutes, wear it. It's not going to hurt you. 
I will tell you that even me till this day with all the stories that I just told you guys that I still forget sometimes, which is the worst thing ever. So obviously no one's going to kill anyone for not. I mean, we're humans. Yeah, we're humans. We make mistakes. But I was at Runyon Canyon the other week and there was no sun. And I went all the way up to the Hollywood sign and down because a friend was visiting. And guess what? My scalp burned because I didn't put my Clarence oil into my hair. Mm-mm. And let's just say, just I should have taken an SPF bottle so that by the time I reached the Hollywood sign, I should have sprayed and then I would have been fine. It's crazy. It really is okay, crazy. Now you know. Finally. Finally, for everyone's favorite part that you all waited so long for, we're going to talk about SPF products, the products we use, the products we know that are popular for the face, for the skin, for your hair. And hopefully this will shed some light on the best products that are out right now. These include both like chemical and mineral. We're, we're not discriminating at this point. None of these are sponsored and none of these are an ad. And before we discuss them, we just want to let everyone know we understand some of them might be too expensive and not in your budget. And if you do plan on investing, which I think you should because SPF should be your new best friend. Maybe if you, let's say, love Starbucks and you get it every day, skip it for a week or two, you know? I mean, would you rather have a mocha frap every day or have burnt, wrinkly skin, you know? <laughs> so the first one is the Junk Elephant Umbra Sheer Physical Daily Defense SPF 30. It's broad spectrum. You could get it for $34. I actually heard this one is amazing. Me too. I want to try it. Okay, the next one is the Kula Full Spectrum 360 Degrees Sun Silk Drops SPF 30 for $46. And I love this one. So this one's for your face. I ordered this one. And I love the fact that it's silky drops. Like it's like basically just putting like a serum on your face. I could only imagine this being the most amazing thing ever because I hate the thickness of SPF. So this is a way to like protect your skin, but you don't feel like you're wearing SPF. It's great. That's pretty cool. I want to order this now. I'm a beauty everything junkie. I want to try everything. We know. We know. (laughs) Uh, If you guys want to know our skincare and our little makeup stuff routine that we do let us know also we'll be glad to i don't know has a hidden talent for makeup that she hasn't come to a realization to that she has it <laughs> but maybe we could do a tutorial at some point whatever you guys want yeah so next one sam uh yeah so elta md so this one replenish broad spectrum spf 44 i think there's an spf 46 also um, There's like a few of them. There's tinted ones with this company. This company has a lot of um, media stuff going on. Like, for yeah. example, Kourtney Kardashian uh, had that in her push box. So it got a lot of attention. A lot of people are buying that yeah. one right now. So this one is $35. It's for the face. It's actually known as probably like the best one on the market right now. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's too expensive too, because like given that this is on your face, 35 bucks and you're not putting the entire bottle on your face, it should last you a good time too. I think that's really important. Okay. Um, the next one, Clarence Sunscreen Care Oil Spray broad spectrum SPF 30. This one is $36. It's for the body. It's also used, fun fact, for your hair. So you spray it on to protect your hair. I love this one. This is my favorite one. I've been using this for like seven years. I actually like the Clarence products. And basically, it's like a body oil. Like, you know, when you were younger, you put on body oil so you could tan. Well, this is a body oil to prevent you from getting too tan or from burning. So I really, really- Or from using beer. (laughs) <laughs> or from using beer. So it kind of gives you that silky, like oily skin look that you love, but you're protecting yourself from the sun. And it's nice because you actually feel where you're applying because the oil stays. It also smells kind of amazing for an SPF. I love this product. It's amazing. Love it. So the next one is my favorite. This is the one that I'm currently using. It is a little bit pricey. Uh, the Tatcha Silken Pore Perfecting Sunscreen. It's broad spectrum, SPF 35, and it costs $65. Yeah, I know. That's a lot. But I'm telling you, it, it's so good. It not only is an SPF, it covers your pores, which I love. So the next one is Super Goop 
unseen sunscreen, broad spectrum, SPF 30. That one's $32. And I did try this before I got a sample from Sephora. A little secret tip, side note about Sephora. If any of these, which most of these you could get at Sephora, if you want to try them out, you don't have to buy the whole thing. You could just ask one of the ladies working there to give you a sample and see how it is, see if you're allergic to it, how your skin reacts. And that's for everything in Sephora. So this one, yeah, this one was really good. This one goes onto your skin and it's like this mattifying effect and your skin feels so silky after. I really like this one. Um, okay. The uh, next one is Dermalogica Prisma Protect SPF 30 moisturizer. It's also expensive, $65. It's meant for the face, but I also heard great things about this product. I personally didn't use this, but I heard it really does wonders. It's an amazing SPF. And then finally, Clarins UV Plus Anti-Pollution Sunscreen Multi-Protection Tint. This one comes in an SPF 50. It's $45. It's for the face. Again, a little goes a long way because you're putting like a dime size on your face. So a lot of these products, yes, they're a little bit more expensive, but they're going to last you a long time. I think um, this product is also really amazing. I've used it on and off for years. It kind of um, doesn't make you feel like you're wearing a lot of SPF. So it's more on the milkier side, but it still has like the classic SPF ingredients in it. So this is also a really good product. Then we'll talk a little bit about some more affordable ones, right? Do we have some affordable ones to tell them about? Yeah. So this one, it's called Misha All Around Safe Block Essence Sun Milk, and it's SPF 50, and it costs $17. You could get this one on Amazon. And I saw this one based on Korean skincare, and you know how Koreans are like the goddesses, the gods of skin. Uh, I literally saw a grandma a Korean grandma walking down the street with an umbrella and I'm not even joking her skin <laughs> looked better than half of my friend's skin at her age so wild and so true yeah and then there's another one Samantha I think you've used it before no yeah La Roche Posay Antilios clear skin dry touch sunscreen SPF 60 it's $20 it's for the body so I love all the La Roche Posay products basically this is like I I would say it's a European pharmacy brand so a lot of the times if you go to any of the pharmacies in Europe these are over the counter they're like sold as if I don't know like a Dove product um, all these products are amazing. This one is also really good for the body. It just depends if you want SPF 60 or not. Um, also, the other thing I kind of wanted to talk about that I don't think we talked about is one like SPF expiring. That's actually important. I don't think that there's an actual SPF expiration date. No, you know, some bottles might not have an expiration date on them, but they say that on average, uh, SPF could last you like about three years. But when your SPF starts to smell funny or discolor, so your white SPF is looking yellow, it is no longer an SPF you can use. So you would have to get a new one. The thing is, a lot of these products, when we leave them, sometimes we'll forget to close a cap or on the beach all day or um, we'll leave it open overnight, or it'll be like out in the sun, even closed, and it will change the ingredients and the chemicals will basically start to de deteriorate in there. So that's a really important thing. So when you mm -hmm. see signs that the SPF is not doing the job it was once doing, it's time for a new SPF. Yeah, so if your bottle does have an expiration date, that's great. Don't use it, though, if you see that it's like two, three years old. Throw it out, get a new one. And when you do get a new one, if it does not have an expiration date, what you can do is, like, in your phone in the notes section, write the date that you first use it or take a Sharpie and write it on the bottle. That way, when three years is up, you'll know when it's no longer good. Also, a thing to note, in November of this year, so 2019, FDA is going to need to deliver like its final monograph um, regarding like the regulations for SPF. So then all these products that are going to be coming out in the market, they're going to have to go through an NDA process and be FDA approved to be sold in the US. So around this time, we're going to have more information about the safety profiles of the SPF product. But until then, as we reiterated many times before, and to sum up everything we've been talking about having some sort of protection against the skin by using SPF is better than having none. Mm -hmm. So let's remember that we have to use SPF. Let's also remember that small doses of sun are good for you, for your health. And let's all work together about protecting your skin. 
yeah, I think we're we're done for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was educational, informative, because it was for us. We learned a lot doing this episode, and I think we're teaching a lot of people with this episode too. Mm-hmm. So for the giveaway, what you need to do is go follow us at The Secret Scope on Instagram. Over there, you will see the post where it will give you all the instructions and information. And one of you lucky winners will win your own SPF. So that wraps up our first episode. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you didn't, please follow us, subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like. We're listening to all your comments, all your opinions. We want to grow together. We want to bring you content that you want to hear. And also make sure to check us out at www.thesecretscope.com. Website's finally out, like I said. And follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at The Secret Scope. Thank you guys once again for tuning in. Don't forget to put on your SPF. And good luck from both of us on our giveaway. Bye.